back over here in Rabbi Tatz, and we left off with this idea that we can... We're in English still, yeah? That we, we, we cannot be responsible for all of the details that Hashem has set up in our life. Who we are, what we are, where we were born, how we were born, where we lived, how we grew up, the innate talents and abilities that we have, the, the inner struggles and challenges that Hashem designed everybody with, the deficiencies that we have in our character that are just innate and inborn inside of us, or the influence of the world that is around us. There are many things that we have no control over at all. So that's not free will. But, as he's been pointing out over here, the way that we will function within the framework that Hashem has designed for us, that's where our free will is going to lie. So he writes over here that the, the following idea, that the modern Western ethos, that's how you say it, ethos, the modern Western ethos tends to frame this issue in terms that do not really accord with the Torah view that we are presenting over here. Meaning, we are presenting a view that says, yes, there are many things that are decided for you already, that you have no way to get out of. But it's not an excuse to go and do with your life whatever it is that you want. And it's not an excuse that if you fail and you, come, you fall short, that you can blame it on everybody else and everything else that happened in your life. We expect something called Bechira, called free will. And free will is, gives you the ability to override the inertia of that place that you find yourself in right now. However, unfortunately, in the world at large, the world doesn't, doesn't necessarily believe this to be the truth. And therefore, it's often, often assumed that all of these different formative variables that a person has in their life, they determine not only the structure of the psyche and the tensions and the innate tendencies of the person, but it also will dictate the choices and the actions that will be manifested as a result of that. Which means, and he's going to give a pretty good example over here of what that means, but that means that a person will say to himself, I cannot control what I do. This is the way that I am born. As they say, love me or leave me, baby. That's how it is. What do you want from me? I was born in this kind of a house. I was put through this kind of a, through a kind of routine. I have predisposition for this desire and that desire. My mind works in a certain way. What do you want from me? It's my fault. So the fact that I ended up going and doing this particular lowly action, that's, that's who I am. I'm not in control of that. So he writes like this, the following, the following point. And he says like this, you have populations of violent criminals. For example, they're found to have biochemical or genetic markers that differ from the general population and correlate statistically with criminal behavior. So again, if you go down into the inner city, and you'll find, you'll, you'll do a survey of, of all the crypts and all the bloods. Yeah, the two gangs, the main gangs over there, in the, in, and you'll, you'll do some, some scientific research on them. Lo and behold, you will probably find that it rings true that there are a lot of innate things inside of them, in their psyche, in their psychological makeup, maybe even in their DNA, that predispositions them for violence, to be murderers, to be ganavim, to be thieves, to be, to be people that you would certainly would not want to meet in an alleyway in the middle of the night. So therefore what? It's often an assumption that the violent behavior is conditioned by the biological factors to the exclusion of volitional control. Meaning that Tyrone down there in the cribs and the bloods, he says, I have a choice. I don't know who my father is. My mother's a drug addict. My older brother was, was taken to, to jail at the age of 18 years old for manslaughter. And I was left around in this crazy world. What do you want from me? I don't have a choice. I don't have a choice. And when he sits on the witness chair because he just got accused of walking into a school and he killed three people, 
And they're claiming, well, he doesn't have a choice because, look, he's psychologically, emotionally, physiologically, everything. He doesn't have a choice. He did what he did because that's how he was raised. That's what he was raised to believe is the way a person lives their life. What do you want from him? And somehow, in many circumstances, this argument holds water as, as painful as the reality is of the people that he killed, but his lawyers get a good argument. The judge and the jury ends up feeling bad for this poor kid. They show pictures of him in his house, sitting in front of a TV all by himself because nobody he's the ultimate latchkey kid that nobody was ever around and he was raised on the streets of downtown LA oh. or in Harlem over there. So what do you want from the kid? Says Rabbi Tatz, you can't say that. Because the perspective of what we are calling the Nakudas HaBechira, which is the point of one's free will, is that it's true that there might be these predisp- uh, predisp- predisposing and measurable variables that shift the nature of the choice significantly in this person. However, how could a person say that I am trapped in the world that I live in and I have no ability to ever make a decision for myself what is right versus wrong. And again, like we mentioned in, in the last class, there are plenty of kids that grew up in the same place with the same elements, with the same brothers who were in the crypts and the bloods and their father they didn't know and the mother was a drug addict and so on and so forth. And when they hit a certain age where they began to mature, they said, I don't want this kind of life. This is for heathens. This is for animals. I don't want this. And they pulled themselves out of the inner city. And they began doing well in their school. And they ended up going off to college. And they got scholarships. And today they're an outstanding person of the society. And they're, they are rehabilitating the youngsters that are back in their old neighborhood, trying to help them become better people. So how do you explain it? One guy pulls the trigger. The other guy ends up becoming a 4.0 GPA in Harvard Law School, and he's an asset to society. Because obviously, says Rabbi Tatz, there's something called free will. Now you could make an excuse all of your life, I don't have free will in this case. I don't have a choice. But at the end of the day, when we go upstairs after 120 years, we'll see how well that excuse is going to hold water. And therefore he writes that there's really nothing that is completely beyond our control. It might make the decision harder to make. It might make it more difficult, meaning if I'm walking down the street and I see a helpless old lady and she's got a very expensive purse on her and I see all of her jewelry worth tens of thousands of dollars, when I walk by her, even if for one second in my mind I would look around and see there's nobody there, let me just knock the lady down, take the jewelry, take the purse, and make a run for it. I'll make $50,000 today. So it's a passing thought that just goes as soon as it comes in, and I walk right past the lady. I might warn her, listen, lady, you know, you're not walking the greatest neighborhood over here. There's a lot going on. You should, can I take you to your car and let you go off safely? But when the crip walks down the street, and he sees the same lady, the same circumstance, and he knows that money's hard to come by these days, and nobody's around, and he can knock her down in a second and take all the jewelry and take the purse, for that guy to say, I'm not going to do it, that's already, that takes a big stretch of the muscles of Bechira, free will that he has, to make the right decision. But, if HaKadosh Baruch created us to have Bechira, which he did, that means that that ability is inside of the person if they just learn how to pump those muscles in the right way. And so Rabbi Tatz writes over here that, again, in, in, his, in his elite English as well, he says that the point is that coercive psychological pressures do not necessarily amount to irresistible force. So that means you can't say at the end of the day, I had no choice. Everybody has a choice. Yeah, but see, the question really is, is that how come it was never like that before? 
How come suddenly, how come, yeah, because, because when you're being fed all of this rhetoric from a young age, and you're being told all of this is good, and it's permissible, and it's, it's the way to go, so then you're being raised with all these things as well. So now a, a kid in today's, ha, has, to, has to make a fair evaluation, and it's becoming very difficult, becoming extremely difficult. But that's what he's saying though, even though that we're in a situation where to see the truth or to do what is right becomes a difficult thing, so it still doesn't exempt you from having to try to do the right thing. Now you might not be successful in rehabilitating yourself if you grew up in downtown LA or in Harlem and all you know is murder, stealing, and, and drug abuse and the like. You might not be fully successful, but you have, an op- you have an obligation to try to realize this is not the way of life. So he says, the critical insight given by the doctrine of point of choice, this, this idea that you have a nekudas habechi, you have a point where you can use your free will, is exactly where, an indiv- exactly where an individual is operating on the scale of choice may not be amenable to control at all, but how he deals with that set of conditions. Meaning, uh, in the same idea, I cannot define the framework which I'm living in. Um, it's not within my control who my parents are, the neighborhood I was born in, the way that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made me. I'm, that's out of my control. But yet HaKadosh Baruch Hu has determined that you will have free will. So if you say that the guy has no choice when he commits manslaughter, or he has no choice when he runs into the, into the uh, jeweler shop and he breaks all the windows and he steals $150,000 worth of jewelry, you say the guy had no choice. You are denying the creation. The creation is you have free will. There are certain things that will be harder to do the right thing. But HaKadosh Baruch expects that every person is going to begin to expand and exercise the free will that they have within inside of them pushing themselves in certain areas, that's the real battle, the real battlefield of free will, to try their best to make the right decisions in life. Couldn't a person look at it from another point of view and say, why has Hashem put such hard obstacles in front of him? Yes, he, f- he sure could. And can you figure out why that reason would be? He, I, I, am being, I have certain challenges in this world that other people do not have to go through because it must be that inside of me is a tremendous amount of potential and overcoming those challenges that Hashem has given me in my life is what is going to make me into the greatest me that I could possibly be. And what if he can't overcome those challenges? He could. The question is if he's going to apply himself to the challenge the way that he should. Which is what we're going to obviously have to speak about more. Yeah, okay, I mean, that's, that's you, you, again, in, in that particular circumstance, you're getting to a place where it's what we would call honest Rahman Apatre. This is, you're in a situation that is way beyond any control at all, and therefore you're going to be exempt from, you'll be exempt from certain things. But, and maybe many things. But, yeah, uh, exempt from... Creating a sin. Exempt from a sin, exempt from utilizing your free will. If a person doesn't have das, they don't have sense of mind to be able to make decisions, so then how could they be held accountable? But say a person person was born like that. Yeah, or brain damage or whatever. Um, But also he wouldn't be allowed to get an aliyah also. That could also be possibly true. I mean, again, you take a woman, for example, in history like Helen Keller. Yeah? She cries out to the whole world that no matter what your circumstances in life are, you always have a choice of how you want to live your life. Who was an anti semite Okay, well, that's another story. But, but she took her bad lot in life, she took a life of challenges, and she decided, I'm not letting the challenges get me. So that means that anybody in life no matter what the challenges are going to be, if they want to, they could redefine their mission or redefine their purpose and decide, I'm going to take it upon myself to move past this. So what I said before, it's the 
obstacles they put in front of you, how you can still overcome. Correct. You put the effort in. Correct. Yes. Because he loves you, <laughs> and he wants you to be great. And if you wouldn't go through the challenge, you would never recognize how great you really are. You'd never pull out the... This is all now in the parshas that we have now with Avram Avinu. Avram is the example of the man who withstood the challenges of life. It, the sages tell us he had 10 tests. But it doesn't mean only 10. He had, he had tests every single day of his life. He had 10 major ones that were above and beyond what the average human being ever had to go through in their life. And it's all, as the Ramban writes in the Chumash, it's all because Hashem wanted to pull out that dormant potential of greatness that was in Avram Avinu to make him even greater for himself. That he should become the greatest Avram that he could be. So every challenge that we go through in life, every handicap, every deficiency, everything that doesn't go the way that we want, everything is to allow us to dig deep inside of ourselves and find that potential that's inside. But wouldn't Hashem know that some of these challenges will be too great for that person? Hashem knows. Yeah, so he would, but, 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 but Hashem will never give a person a challenge that in theory they cannot overcome. So if I fail the test, it's because I didn't try hard enough. And you get points for trying. You and, you, and, you, and you get points. Yes, you get, you get many points for trying. But if I stumble and I fail, I can't blame it on God. And I can't blame it on somebody else. At the end of the day, I have to look back at myself and say, maybe if I would have put in some more effort in that particular area, I would have been able to overcome it. Because if Hashem sent me that test, He must know what I have inside of me that's capable of rising to the occasion. You know, the bottom line is that we are asking, why do people have it nice and easy and some people have it hard? <laughs> okay. That's the bottom line. Okay. And there's no answer to well, that. But, that, but, that, but that, is, that is the answer. Different people have different missions that they have to accomplish in this world. And that's one of them. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you next time.